start of the year. That looks like Canada to me. That's where I'm going to be in three months' time, something like that. See our son and grandchildren. Jesus said this. He said, whoever believes in me, sorry, Jesus stood up and cried, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now he said this. Now this he said about the spirits, those whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. At the beginning of the year, I want to start by remembering who we are. Who I am, who you are. Whoever believes in me, Jesus said. Whoever. I like, there's a few whoever's in the Bible, and I like them, because it's very inclusive. <laughs> whoever. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you? Do you believe that he's the son of God? Yeah. Do you believe that he's the way, the truth, the life? Then out of you, out of your innermost being, flows rivers of living water. I just want you to receive that right now. It's not what you do. He didn't say if you do this or if you do that. He said those who believe, to those who believe, out of you will flow rivers of living water. Then it said that the spirit had not been given for he had not yet been glorified. Well, we're, we're past that. <laughs> the spirit has been given. And out of you, that's you. <laughs> Little old you. Rivers of living water. And those rivers, firstly, we'll come to secondly later, but firstly, they flow for you. It's a heavenly river. It carries the very essence of heaven with it. A river that carries joy. This river brings heavenly refreshment. This river brings contentment in God. I want you to make space at the beginning of this year for a river to flow. And I want that river to revitalize you to encourage you. And I want it to spark your imagination. The Apostle Paul writes, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. When the river flows, the heart rejoices. When the river flows, celebrating Jesus, giving him thanks, is the most natural thing to do. And when the river flows, we know that we're all on the same team. And actually... The submitting to one another out of reverence for Jesus isn't difficult when we're in that same river. Jesus says, it's a promise. Jesus says that to those who believe in him, out of his heart, out of his innermost being, will flow rivers, plural rivers of living water. Are you thirsty this morning? I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. But there's a river. And I want to drink from that river. 
The water is for you. It's for your refreshment. It's here right now. We can just sit by the river. <laughs> What's it the psalmist says? He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. We start from that place. That's where we start from. It's a picture of sheep. You know, sheep are very reluctant to go to very fast running water. But they still need to drink. And it'll cause them emotional distress to come down to a fast flowing river to, to drink. That's why the psalmist says, he leads me beside still waters. Because we need those places of silence, those places of quiet, those places where he restores our soul. That's where I want us to start from this year. It's who we are. We're his sheep and he loves us. But this river is also going to flow for others. It's for us, it's for me, it's for you, but it's for others as well. It flows out of you. It's for your family. It's for your neighbours, perhaps your colleagues. It's for the people you meet in the street and on the bus. And as soon as I say that, we get anxious. <laughs> you go, oh, <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Well, Mary does. <laughs> Mary talks to everybody, which is wonderful. But some of us are like, you know what? I'm going to be honest. Last Wednesday, I was in here on the front desk. I was just doing my, my duty for the Forest Centre. Gets lots of perks by doing that. Um, <laughs> Right, wipe that off the tape. Um, <laughs> but I was just sitting there and there was a lady in here um, and she came out and she was wandering around. She said, oh, my back hurts so much. And I was going, Lord, I want to pray for her. I want to pray for her. And I, I was having a conversation with her and I was just waiting for the conversation to come round to somewhere where I say, do you mind if I just come out and pray for you? And I never did. And I really feel like I missed it. We feel like that sometimes. We go, oh, you know what? I really missed that. I should have, should have found a way, but I didn't. And I really wanted to pray for her as well because she was in so much pain. We do miss it. But this is the thing, you see. Actually, the river just flows. You don't make it flow. You don't yourself and make the river come out it just flows out of you shall flow rivers of living water we can start thinking oh, i've got to do this or i've got to do that but it starts in resting in who you are and in what you've got i feel it's vital this year that we start from that place So much of this world, and maybe you, is caught in a performance culture. We want to be recognised. We want our bosses, our colleagues to know that we are performing well. We want our presence on social media to be liked or followed. We don't want anyone to know just how much we struggle, just how hard it is sometimes. A performance culture, that is not a kingdom culture. It's not. We need to start putting some things down and say, you know what? I want to do excellently. I do want to do excellently. I'm not looking at perfection. Perfection 
drives me. It says you're not doing well enough. It says you could have done that better. Let's just open the bin and put perfection in there. We want excellence. But excellence comes from being. It just comes from practice. It's not about performance. Performance culture leads to anxiety. And our anxiety that fills us, fills our lives with doing the unnecessary, isn't what he asked us to do. But we've got to do it because we've got to perform. One of the hardest things of being a pastor is that the only person that's measuring me is God. You know, sometimes I find it really hard to know if I'm doing well enough. I don't know. I've no idea. I don't know what it's supposed to look like. I just make it up as I go along. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, you knew it all along, didn't you? You, pre- <laughs> you all knew it. You were just not telling me that we know you. But it's the thing, it's the thing you know, it's like, oh, how do you, you don't measure, don't measure yourself by somebody else. Don't do it. It's just not the place to go. It's so easy to put unrealistic expectation on both ourselves and others. I'll come to our five priorities in a minute because it's important I talk about that on the first Sunday. (laughs) But the first priority is presence. God's presence. That's our first priority. We want to know the presence of God in our meetings. But more than that, we want to cultivate an intimacy with God. And that starts at home. That starts when I'm out for a walk. That starts in those quiet places. Sometimes, for me, getting out for a walk actually is the best thing because if I sit in my office, I'm surrounded by stuff. And it, I look at the stuff and I think, well, that needs doing and that needs doing. And, oh, and it needs tidying up. <laughs> If I'm out for a walk, all of it's out of the way. And I can tune into that river of life that's flowing. And I want to find that strength by being by that river. Intimacy. You know, your mind will tell you it's a waste of time. It will. It'll say, well, you're not doing anything, are you? You're not achieving anything. It's a lie. The best thing that you can do is find space to tune into that river. That river of God that's flowing in you. That's what the word says. Out of you shall flow. It will. You don't make it happen. It just does. Let's talk about the five, our five priorities just for a moment. Why is it? It stopped working. Thank you, Steve. You see, these five priorities can imply action. But grace means that They come from a place of rest. And I know I can be one of the worst people. If any of you were around me in the lead up to Christmas, I really (laughs) apologise. Getting stressed. 
trying to make things happen. You're all so gracious. <laughs> you say, oh, I didn't notice. Yes, you did. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> but it's our priorities. The first one, they're not particularly in the order except for the first one, presence, the presence of God. We need the presence of God. Power. Jesus came on earth to represent the Father, to show what the Father's like. If Jesus needed power to do that, boy, do I. I need power. That's our second priority. Third priority. I feel this is so important for this year. Salvations. I want to see many people's lives come to Christ. I'll talk about that in a minute. Communion and fellowship. What we do when we gather around the communion is so important. And I think we've, as I said before, I think we've yet to realise the full impact of doing that. We kind of do it knowing we do it out of obedience in a sense. But I think one day a revelation will come and we'll go, oh, this is amazing. And the presence of God will come upon it in a way we've never experienced. We're going to keep doing it. Part of that, alongside that, is fellowship. Having one another around for a meal. Spending time together. Building relationship. It's really important. A kingdom of priests, and I won't say much about that because I can preach for hours on that, but it's, it's about the fact that every one of us is made individually and every one of us, God has got his hand upon for something. You're not all going to be pastors. Maybe some of you are, I hope so. <laughs> but not all of you are going to be pastors. That's not the only place you serve God. Everything you do, God can use you where you are. I was an engineer for years, and I've said this many times. I've been an engineer for years before I was a pastor, and I knew God at work in me. He would give me, I've got so many patents to my name, I can't even remember what they are. I don't care, actually. But they were ideas that came from heaven. I don't own them. They're all owned by Sony, who I work for, but... um, they, they got my name on them. But actually it was, should have Holy Spirit written on it. <laughs> but God has, has solutions for every problem in this world. And to those who will listen, he will give those solutions. To those who seek him, he will give them. Amen. Every answer, every problem, isn't it, Slava? It doesn't matter whether it's oil in the ground whether it's an elect- inside electronic chip, that was my problems, or whatever it is, he has solutions. I believe there are solutions for global warming yet to be found. Maybe it's be one of you. Anyway, a kingdom of priests. Um, and if you can go on to the next slide, Steve. Oh, the... Um, oh. Um, as long as the, uh, along with the, with the, those priorities, there are five practices. I'm not saying anything about them, but valuing the scriptures, prayer, worship, kingdom, discipleship, and continually being filled with the Spirit. I don't want to say anything more about that, but it's beginning of the year, so it kind of seemed important. I believe it's a breakthrough for salvation, though, this year. In your resting, I want you to engage your God-given imagination and use that to pray. Pray for your family, pray for your friends, pray for your road you live in, pray for your workplace or your school and college, whatever, wherever you find yourself. And I want you to start imagining what it would be like if, say, there were several houses in your road, homes in your road, where people love Jesus and you are working together for that road. Maybe several people in your workplace, 
that you meet together with regularly and you pray for that place. You pray for the people. You pray for the business. Use your imagination. Imagine what that would be like to have the house next door, another Christian family there, and you're in there and you're praying together for your neighbours. First time I went to Ukraine with Slava, we visited a small village south of Kiev. Um, and the church there seemed to know the birthday of every single person in the village. And on their birthday, they would bring a cake round. Or they'd bring something round to celebrate that birthday. If a baby was born, then they would organise like a, like a baby shower, we call it, or the Americans call it. But they would organise something so that that family, who were very, there were a lot of them were very poor families, were looked after. When we went there, they were all packed into this room. We, we had the privilege of sitting on the sofa that actually had nothing left apart from wooden beams inside it. It was extremely uncomfortable, but we had the sofa. Um, they were all sat on planks on upturned buckets, crammed into this tiny room. But I tell you, there was such a hunger for God in that room. Such a hunger for God. And many of the people in that room were not Christians. They'd come because of the love that they'd been shown by the people in the village. Crammed into this tiny house because of kindness. Kindness is such an undervalued thing that we can share with others. I remember particularly a young, young lady, a teenager. She had such joy, yet had just recently in the previous weeks witnessed her father kill her mother and then her father being taken away and put in prison and now she was the head of the household looking after her younger brother. And yet, she, had, she was filled with joy because the people of the church, as soon as they knew, they were there looking after her, making sure she had everything she needed, that she knew that there was people that she could go to. And she found Jesus. And you could look at her and you say, I cannot believe that that was her story. It was just weeks earlier. Kindness. That's all it was, kindness. She got picked up by those streams of living water that flowed out of the people of that village. People who themselves had very little. But they had a river. A river that flowed. Last year I spoke about heaven. I spoke a little bit of what it means to be in a place where the rule and reign of God is evident in everything. This world here is but a shadow of what's to come. But unless someone receives Jesus, receives that salvation that he, he purchased for them, then this life is as good as it's going to get. And that, for many, is miserable. There's rivers that flow from you and me. And those rivers are for me and for you, but they're also for the others. It's supposed to be the most natural thing in the world. 
But how do those rivers touch other people? I think the number one way is through your words. Yes, it'll happen through action. It'll happen through touch. But to get there, it usually starts with words. I don't know if you heard, but it was in the papers last week, I think, might have been the previous week, but they did, they did some research, some experiments about talking to people. Did you, did you come across that? They basically had a control group who were just to carry on life as normal. And then they had another group, same size, and they were encouraged to talk to people, talk to people on the train, talk to people on the bus, talk to people on the tube, all the things British people don't do, you know. <laughs> they were just encouraged to talk to people. And during this, after this experiment, they found that the people that were asked to talk to people, some of them found it really hard to start conversations. But actually, at the end of the day, they were far happier than the people who didn't talk to people. How interesting is that? <laughs> that even talking to people on the bus... And the other thing they found out, I don't know how they did that. They must have followed people around. I don't know. But they found out that the people that they spoke to on the bus or the train <laughs> also enjoyed having someone speak to them. This is just talking. This isn't, I'm not talking about, I've got to get the gospel in. I'm just talking about being friendly to people. Now, I'm an introvert, total, and I find it hard to talk to people on the train, on the tube. But I do remember 2012, the Olympics. I love the Olympics. It was just the sort of thing I love. But we went, we, we were lucky to get tickets one day at the um, main stadium. And um, um, on the train, on the tube, on the tube going to the Olympics, everyone in the carriage was talking to everyone else. Like, this is the British tube in London. Like, this, what? <laughs> But people were just so excited about what... And there was people from all around the world in that tube train. They obviously didn't know the English culture was you don't talk to anyone in the tube. Um, I have a friend, actually, a friend called Ian, um, and he told me about one of his friends who's a poet, and he says his friend has started on the tube reading his poetry so he'll stand up clear his throat and then go I'm going to read you a poem and he just reads a poem on the tube to the people in the in the in the in the train and he says he gets a round of applause you see people actually enjoy some interaction you've probably seen the videos where people have like done music impromptu music on tube trains you know they just got their instruments out and started doing stuff People love it. It's talking to people. Anyway, I've talked about that far too long. Um, <laughs> kindness. I've talked about them before, but both Peter in the Bible and Zacchaeus, remember him, Both were impacted by kindness. Peter, this hardened fisherman, gets a catch that will sink his boat. And he was overwhelmed. And he falls before Jesus and he says, Depart from me, I'm a sinner. It was kindness. Yes, it was a miracle as well, but it was kindness. Zacchaeus didn't even take a miracle. All it needed was for him to know that somebody wanted to come to his house to eat. The outcast. Zacchaeus, the outcast. Zacchaeus, the nasty. 
Zacchaeus the one nobody wanted to talk to. All it took was someone to say, Jesus, I'm coming to your house, Zacchaeus. Let's have a meal together. And the result was Jesus says, this day salvation has come to this house. And boy, did that town change. Zacchaeus knocks on the door. Oh, it's him. Let's not open the door. No, no, I've come to give you money. <laughs> I've come to give you what you didn't, what I took that I shouldn't have done. Can you imagine him going around the whole neighborhood and then gossip, them gossiping, saying, you know what, Zacchaeus came around and gave me money. <laughs> the whole atmosphere of that, that, that town must have changed because of kindness. I don't know where I am on here. Uh, <laughs> Paul writes to the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Gosh, I've run out of time. Um, the gospel, <laughs> you, what do you mean you're not surprised? <laughs> the gospel finds good soil when the ground's prepared and it's prepared by kindness. Good news is that Jesus has saved us from our fallen nature. It isn't that people are necessarily nasty. Actually, a lot of them are really nice people. I'm going to stop talking, telling stories. Let's go on. Um, they are, though. They're really lovely people. And the problem is The problem is that actually we're judged by something that's impossible to deal with. We, we are sinners because of Adam. We can't do anything about that. We're bound by the law, and the law doesn't give anyone a break. But once somebody is over the fact that they need rescuing... The rest is easy. That's the difficult bit. People don't want rescuing. But kindness softens the soil for the gospel message. The Holy Spirit flows within you and me. Rivers of life that will touch people's lives. Many struggle with the words that Jesus said, but he was loved by thousands. Why? Because he was straightforward, he was honest, he was loving, he healed many, and he had a gentle but powerful authority about him that was hard to ignore. When, when we meet Jesus, everything changes. <laughs> Changes everything. Priorities are reordered. Truth itself takes on a tangible form. And perhaps most importantly, we find hope. Hope in a hopeless world. Peter was out fishing with the guys. Things had turned out really strange. This Jesus that he'd put his hope in had been crucified. But then beyond all understanding, he'd risen from the dead and appeared to them. Peter had determined to stay by the side of Jesus, to defend him at any cost. But then when he cut off the ear of a soldier, Jesus told him to put his sword away and healed the guy. Peter denied that he knew Jesus, even though he said he wouldn't. Three times he denied him. And he needed to clear his head. He's like, I don't know where I stand anymore. I'm going to go fishing. Come on, guys, we're going fishing. And he goes fishing. And they'd been all out all night 
and not caught a single thing. Second time that had happened. And as dawn is breaking, Jesus is building a fire on the, on the shore. He's cooking some breakfast. It's powerful what eating can do. Eating together. And he shouts out, he says, children, do you have any fish? No, comes back the reply. And he says, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it out and they can't haul it in because there's so many fish. Strangely, it's John that recognises who's on the beach. But as soon as he says it, Peter's like, I've got to get to him. So he gets dressed. It's funny, isn't it? John, it's John again, isn't it? Telling us he wasn't wearing anything. Anyway, um, <laughs> Peter jumps into the sea and swims to Jesus. He needs to get his, his head sorted out. And Jesus has breakfast ready for him. At that breakfast, there's restoration. Some of us need restoration. Some of us need to have breakfast with Jesus. And have what's been stripped away by the world by our sin, by our failure, restored. But Jesus doesn't just restore Peter. You know the story. He recommissions him. He says, Peter, feed my lambs. Peter, I've got a job for you to do. Put it aside. Put aside the failure. It's been dealt with. It's all done. It's all gone. Restored, commissioned. Jesus wants to restore us. And he wants to recommission us. That's what's happening. I believe this is a year of a change of season. Last year, a few of us got together prophetically, if we can say that, to ask God about what's coming. And there's a sense of a change of season. It feels like it's been winter forever. And for many people in this world, it's still winter. It feels, uh, do you know the story of my Lion Witch in the wardrobe? <laughs> winter, but never Christmas. Well, folks, Christmas is here <laughs> and spring is coming. I believe we're in a change of season. Although we might not be yet in full harvest of summer, spring has its own harvest. And I believe we're in a time of springtime. A time of change, a time of hope, a time of new life. It isn't a message about hitting targets, getting sales. It's about love. It's about friendship. It's about grace. God has already done what we couldn't do. He freely forgives everyone who calls on his name. He's not looking for us to do anything but rest in him and be obedient. And that isn't a credit scheme that we have to pay off. 
<laughs> All our debt is dealt with. I love the hymn, and can it be, apart from the last line, which I hate. It says, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. I don't like it because it sounds like I'm trying to set, settle a debt. The love so amazing, so divine was freely given. It doesn't demand anything. The price is paid. There is nothing demanded. For that is the nature of true grace. Many will come to Christ this year. God will use you and he will use me because there are rivers flowing out of us. And there will be fruit. And I think Slav's going to talk about that next week. I hope I haven't stolen too much, Slav. Um, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful for what God has done. And I look forward to this year with excitement. And I'm sorry I've gone on 10 minutes over. Um, Father, thank you for your goodness to us. And I pray, Father, for everyone in this room, everyone watching on, the, on, the, on, the, on YouTube. I pray, Father, that you would not only restore them, but you would commission them. That they would know that all that they do flows from that place of rest. That your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Father, I pray that you would take of us a performance culture. That we can be in you and rest in you and see that river flow for the sake of this community. Lord, I pray, save Borden and Whitehill. Save many hundreds of people, I pray, Lord, across this community. Lord, may there need to be another church, another two churches, another three churches, another four churches, Lord, because there are so many in this town. Lord God, have mercy. Lord, may you commission us every one of us, for what you have for us in whatever, wherever that is. In your name, amen. Bless you all. Thank you so much.